Can you tell us uh, your role, elaborate on your role at CFAC and what does CFAC do? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Managing Chronic Diseases and Food Insecurity Patients Through Produce Prescription Programs. I just want to thank everyone for coming to the conference and hearing our session. My name is Ian Finch. I am the Food Access Program Director at the Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, uh, affectionately known in Missoula as CFAC. CFAC is a community-driven nonprofit coalition that was founded in 2005 in response to a community food assessment in Missoula. And more recently, you know, over the last almost 20 years, we have been growing into a statewide organization that addresses food systems issues holistically through three different program areas that align with our organizational mission. And really what those look like is starting with farmers, we do beginning farmer and rancher training to ensure that producers in the state of Montana have the capacity, the know-how and the resources, even the land base to actually be able to produce food for these different kinds of food access programs we're gonna be talking about that CPAC hosts. So we work with the farmers and the ranchers. We have a land use preservation program that actually looks to work with retiring ranchers, retiring farmers to conserve and preserve their farmland and have a transfer of rights to that land from these new beginning farmers we're working with. And then the third piece is of course our food access program and that's the program that I lead. And within that program, our overall approach is to create community driven solutions to food and nutrition insecurity by collaborating with local service providers to incentivize the consumption of locally grown fruits and vegetables for clients experiencing food insecurity. We really specialized in this area because we see the connection between helping farmers, families, and the economy. And these types of nutrition incentive programs like produce prescriptions can really target and support all three of those sectors. So you'll see across our program portfolio, we have double SNAP dollars that provides a match for SNAP users. We have a senior farmer's market nutrition program that provides coupons for seniors to go shopping at the local farmer's market. And then we have this third area of produce prescriptions that we're talking about today. And I just wanted to mention that really in essence, all three of these programs are produce prescription programs. We're being prescriptive in the approach that fruits and vegetables are identified as a holistic way to approach health outcomes. And we're being prescriptive in a way that we're incentivizing patients or clients in all of these different programs to go out and find the, these, this produce at redemption sites. And we're providing a financial incentive for them to be able to stretch their budget to do that. So produce prescriptions we love, food is medicine we love because it's really finally naming and addressing the core concept. CFAC first got involved in this because of the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program, which is a federal program through the National Institute of Food and Agriculture that provides funding for programs to um, enhance and grow nutrition incentive programs in their community. CFAC has been involved with this program since 2015 through our Double SNAP Dollars program. And we really found that we had laid a network across the state of farmers markets, farmers, and service providers who were really interested in helping patients or clients access these local food outlets. So we really had a network in place to be able to help healthcare providers connect to local producers in their community to be able to do these programs. And they're actually pretty similar across the board when providing a prescription or a, some kind of an incentive to a client. There are similar mechanisms across these programs for how we do that intervention or how we do a preventative level of service. And so we thought, you know, it sounds like this other program area is right up our alley. It's right al um, aligned with our mission. And we already had a statewide steering committee network that included dietitians, that included healthcare providers. And we were looking at double SNAP dollars and thought, you know, we better start taking a look at produce prescriptions. So it really came first from that steering committee level. And we also identified that in our existing work with just SNAP-based nutrition incentive programs, SNAP is not, SNAP is formerly known as food stamps, and it's not necessarily the best fit for every community because of lack of access to SNAP retailers in some places, especially farmers markets that might have SNAP um, eligible items or be processing SNAP transactions for customers. So produce prescriptions offer an opportunity to kind of go around that SNAP a barrier to really start addressing some of these things outside of that program area. So it really helps to expand the service that we can provide and also 
increased flexibilities on the items that people in these programs um, can purchase with their benefits to be outside of the SNAP program. These programs have been formed in a grassroots setting over the last 20 years, and there is no one produce prescription program. This is a food as medicine movement, and what we're trying to do collectively is identify patients who are at risk of chronic health outcomes because of diet-related and food insecurity reasons, and then find ways to intervene or to treat that patient with a prescribed food diet. Um, that can take place in many ways, but typically has specific parts, um, especially when we're working in the healthcare setting with hospitals. So um, in the beginning, while clients are going through the hospital setting, it starts with some kind of a screening to understand if a client is in a food insecure state and what chronic diseases they are at risk of. So there's this eligibility screening. Once we find that they meet those requirements, a healthcare either provider either refers internally to another provider that might be doing nutrition education and connecting them to a local um, producer, or might be referring them outside of that healthcare setting to a third party community-based organization that might be running a produce prescription program in their community. So there's the screening, there's the referral, um, that prescription is then provided to that client so that they can take to redeem at whatever site is set up in that community. The prescription may be provided by a registered dietitian, it may be provided by a nurse, it may be provided by a doctor. What we like about these programs is that we don't have to require someone with a doctoral degree to be providing the prescription. These are more community-based approaches that we can um, you know, be successful at without going all the way up to that level. Uh, once they receive that prescription, there's always some kind of redemption site. Again, models across the country and even in Montana are really disparate with this piece. Sometimes, you know, people are going to, again, a farm stand at the hospital to redeem immediately when they receive that prescription. Sometimes we see them being referred to a farmer's market where they'll have the opportunity to choose which vendors they wanna shop from. And a lot of the time we see them being referred to grocery stores. What we really like about grocery stores, although we're not sure um, you know, the level or not that they're able to provide uh, local food year round, they are able to provide food year round throughout the week, in the evening, on the weekends and really create more access to programs. So I think grocery store partners are really important to look at. Um, and of course, once they redeem their prescriptions at one of those outlets, and I did want to say that um, through the Rural Prescription Produce Toolkit that Sharing Our Strengths is sharing right now, they're sharing that over 50% of these models are some kind of food box or CSA model as well. So we've really seen that, you know, we're putting together boxes that can be tailored to people's chronic health outcomes. And then I think better address directly those needs of those clients. Um, that model then does not address, um, you know, community connectedness as much, uh, but is a more direct, maybe even a home delivered food box, which then of course is just about increasing access. The final pieces that some programs offer and some don't are the nutrition or culinary education and the data collection and evaluation requirements. You know, typically that data collection and evaluation comes when grantors request it. Um, otherwise, we're really looking at just targeting food insecurity and getting people those fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, but we are really into data collection. It's one of our top priorities with this project because we need that information to be able to advocate for, you know, increasing of these programs in the future. And so this is kind of that snapshot of what a produce prescription does and how it operates. And again, they're different in every community. And I'm so excited to hear from some of the ones in Montana today. Can you talk about the produce prescription work group? So the working group is a mix of existing programs and then also new entry programs that are curious about how this connection between food and health can operate in their communities. So through this collaborative, we hope to do a couple of things, do knowledge transfer between these existing and new programs, but we also hope that by bringing everyone together through a collaborative approach, we can help these grassroots programs unlock larger scale funding at the federal, state, or other levels that they might not have access to otherwise. And so by bringing us all together, we can really unlock these opportunities to mainstream produce prescriptions. In your opinion, what are the benefits of the food as medicine movement? And also if you see any downsides to it. Sure, so I really see benefits happening at a couple of different levels. Again, we're looking at benefits 
first and foremost, primarily to that client and their individual health. So we really see and we have evidence based approaches now that actually show and prove that these programs can affect people um, with health outcomes. And typically we're looking at hypertension, diabetes, obesity, anxiety Food can be a tool to help alleviate these health disparities um, in patients that we're seeing, especially because they're affected and driven by food insecurity. We also see that just more generally than just those health outcomes and biomarkers, the produce prescription programs can increase food access and decrease overall food insecurity. So we do see that the cons both the consumption overall and the types of fruits and vegetables that people are consuming increase when they participate in programs such as these. Um, I would also say that at the individual level, it helps these clients feel connected to their community and to their local food system. We you know, provide nutrition education and then also avenues for people to go out to actually be able to engage with farmers and food producers in the community through farmers markets, farm stands, and even at retail grocery stores, we can provide information so that people can navigate those grocery stores to be able to find the freshest and most local available produce. And finally, because of that nutrition education, I think that the impacts to the individual are that we have improved overall health and understanding of nutrition so that people can take that power into their own hands to make sure that they can do it their way with the products that they want and have that agency to make that choice. And by providing that financial incentive, we help stretch their food budget so that they can actually feel like they can afford to shop where they deserve and desire. On the community level, I just want to say these programs, you know, we're always thinking about the producers as well. Uh, these programs open new and really interesting and meaningful markets for producers to be involved in. So even from that perspective, producers are then able to act on their own desires, their philosophies to help their community in a very direct and impactful way. It connects the producers to those consumers and creates a community vibe brings people out, it feels like an event, and it can just really help reinforce those relationships for the long term. And finally, we see improved patient provider relationships at the clinic level. We're finally, you know, going past this kind of power relationship between the provider and the client to connect around food and be able to say that you deserve to have the food that you want that can actually help address your chronic health condition um, as medicine. And I think that that's a powerful thing that can really help increase relationships between healthcare providers and their patients. Montana is a vastly rural state. We have a million people across millions of acres. We're the fourth largest state. And so I think some of the first challenges when setting up programs like this really just come down to identifying, you know, what resources a community has, what food is available, what kind of healthcare clinics are in that community to be doing a prescription service like this. Um, so really it's the distance to the services for the clients. They might need to travel into town to get to a qualifying health clinic or somewhere else that's providing this service. They're going to need to drive to a redemption site if it's not at the clinic. So we have those transportation barriers for the participants, certainly. And I think that provides an opportunity to think about how we can support them with their transportation. And, you know, again, in a rural nature, we often don't have public services for transportation to get a client from their home to a market. And so we need to be thinking about how things are moving around, both how food is moving around and how those clients are moving around to get to the food. But we also know that unfortunately, half of Montana's counties are considered food deserts, which means that clients need to travel 10 miles or more to actually reach a market where food is being sold. I think another big challenge for these programs is funding, of course. You know, when you're implementing this program, you need to think about how you're doing the patient screening and intake, enrollment, how you're assessing for food insecurity. You know, maybe you're providing nutrition education, maybe not. Maybe you're doing an evaluation and data collection, maybe not. But all of these things take a lot of time and effort. So we need to fund the staffing. We need to fund the clinicians who are doing the prescriptions. And I think one of the largest challenges of all is finding the funding that can actually support that produce prescription itself, the money to provide that incentive for that customer, that patient to go and get the food to address their chronic health state. And so uh, again, that produces an opportunity for people to come together in the state of Montana to be able to access larger funding um, by doing it together. And then finally, again, just that building of relationships between producers, retail partners, and the clinics. It's again, 
relationships take time to develop and these program models are incredibly diverse. We see food box programs, we see people being sent to grocery stores, farmers markets, um, maybe they have a medically tailored meal. So there are all of these different ways. And when a program operator is considering what they need to do, what they want to do for their program, again, they need to look at the community resources in their town and their county, and then think, okay, how are we going to end up connecting these producers? And then how are we going to find the money to do that? How about engaging healthcare and prioritizing um, nutrition as a means to address chronic illnesses? Um, have you found barriers in that aspect? Just in my experience, as we've been doing outreach to community partners in Montana, everyone we have talked to is 100% on board with this approach, which is, I think, um, kind of new. In the last 10, 20 years, it's been a long journey going from a, you know, in intervention approach where we're providing a prescription drug to treat symptoms, getting to the place where we're understanding that food can be a precursor, a pre-entry to that healthcare um, has taken time. But everyone that we work with, especially the dietitians, the nurses, the people who are there every day seeing those clients, they understand that food insecurity is a piece of this puzzle. And so they want to launch into this work. They want to bring their passion and their charisma, and they want to work with their own hospitals to better understand the impacts of these programs. Because a lot of the time, the hospital system is still engaged in that kind of old mode of providing healthcare. I do think that those hospitals, once we, you know, make a transition of understanding, they can also become engaged funding partners for this work. Can you talk about the challenges in implementing this work? We can also change the politics and advocate for these programs so that we can institutionalize them for the long run. What are your long-term visions of um, bringing all these different partners and stakeholders together? That's a great question, Linda. And really what we want to see is a unified movement for produce prescriptions or food as medicine or food RX in Montana. We want to see state support. We want to see everyone working together to make sure that clients across the state have access to these same opportunities rather than just being in these distinct small grassroots areas. So we're really talking about mainstreaming these programs across the state to increase impact, to elevate advocacy, to increase awareness and knowledge for these clients. I see a really well-funded state program that can support individualized models across the state that can implement in their way and then feed that information back up to a hub so that we can best understand how these programs are impacting people in Montana. We have good evidence-based data on how these programs are affecting clients in other states and we need that information here. We need local data so that we know what will work best for Montanans. And so I see a way to harmonize that data collection to have um, congruency in what we're tracking in biomarkers through patients so that again we can actually determine those healthcare outcomes through data so that looks like you know getting people around to be focusing on just a couple or key critical biomarkers like a1c or like cholesterol levels so that we can actually track together the impacts so that we can understand overall how these programs are operating can you talk um, about the, some of the specific partners in the working group? So the working group is really composed of a diverse group of produce prescription programs that have all developed their own model up to this point. Now we're kind of looking at how we can share that information, how maybe we can do things more similarly, like I was saying before, for that shared um, understanding. But uh, some of the key critical healthcare partners we have are Landahan Montana and Bar One Wellness. They'll be speaking on this session as well. And both of those programs are already engaged with healthcare partners in their communities where at Logan Health up in um, North Valley of the Flathead and then with community health partners in Belgrade and Bozeman, these programs are already working with healthcare providers to be providing a prescription to then be referred to other services to either redeem money for food or to receive nutrition education. I do think it's really interesting. Our programs are not all around produce prescriptions. We are also thinking larger in Montana. So some of these like the FoodRx program has already been able to go beyond that prescription kind of barrier. They're providing things like cooking oil, like knife skills, 
like uh, maybe even bread and cheese and some other core foods so that it can be more of a holistic package. And what we see Bar One Wellness doing, you know, Amber Barone is so innovative and she's including things like wellness programs, like yoga, like transportation cards to really help clients be able to access that food and have a wraparound wellness course so that they can abs you know, think holistically about health and not just relation to calories in, calories out and the food itself. Um, other program partners are out in Eastern Montana. Uh, we have One Health out in Miles City. They have clinics throughout Eastern Montana, Central Montana, and even Wyoming. And we're looking at how to scale up programs there so that we can have higher impact in those regions. And then we're really excited about our tribal members. We understand that health impact really needs to involve the Native American voice. And in Montana with eight federally recognized reservations and 12 tribes, we really see that these programs can also aim to increase and support existing food sovereignty projects. So Fast Black Feet's not here today, but their uh, food pharmacy program is a great example of a native led program that is prescribing fruits and vegetables through their food pantry with a, uh, support from a registered dietitian where people are then going to two different grocery outlets. They have their system set up and running. People are already seeing health outcomes and we're really excited that this collaborative is going to be bringing these voices together so that we can together understand how these existing grassroots programs are impacting their clients. You know, we're so lucky to have other statewide partners. We really couldn't do this without an understanding of what's happening across the state, especially because we're just one organization in Missoula. So other statewide partners we have, um, you know, DPHHS and their American Indian Health Program has come out in full support of this and the diabetes prevention program at the state level with their health coach network is really interested. So we're looking at how to engage with those statewide partners at the governmental level. Also, of course, Montana No Kid Hungry is an amazing partner. They're the hosts of this session today, and they also are partners with Sharing Our Strength which provides produce prescription grants. So they're a funding partner, they're an outreach partner. And again, we are just so thankful for these partnerships that help amplify and elevate our voices while we're doing this work on the ground. I would also say our partnership statewide with the Montana Nutrition Education Program through MSU Extension is amazing. Not every program has registered dietitians or even health coaches or people on staff that understand these connections. They have these you know, nutrition educators in almost all of the counties in Montana, and they have come forward to commit to providing referrals of our clients to their programs to be able to receive that nutrition education so that we're not just sending people out there to try to use this produce without an understanding of how to do things like food storage, shopping on a budget, how to prepare healthy meals with, you know, minimum ingredients. And so that program also helps provide that support at a statewide level. So it really is this network that's slowly coming together to create this statewide program that's going to have the support from these multi-sectored organizations in addition to the healthcare providers. Hi, I'm Gretchen Boyer, uh, the Executive Director for Land to Hand Montana, and I'm going to be giving you a presentation on our food prescription program that we have up here in the Flathead. Um, Land to Hand is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to build a strong community food system that fosters socially just ways of accessing food. And we do this through many ways. And today we're gonna to mainly talk about our food prescription program. So thanks for being here. Um, so originally our program um, started with a want to bring healthy food to clinics in Kalispell, Whitefish and Columbia Falls. And we worked originally with Logan, the Logan Health Foundation in Whitefish and discussed the possibility of bringing uh, CSAs, which is Community Supported Agriculture Farm Shares, to uh, a clinic in Columbia, the primary care clinic in Columbia Falls. Um, in that first year, we started with purchasing a couple shares and giving them to food insecure clients at the clinic. Now, this beginning, these humble beginnings that we had were um, not very organized and kind of just to see what interest patients might have in the food. Um, that was brought to the clinic, and we found that there was tons of interest. So we decided to formalize the program a, as a partnership with Logan Health Whitefish, 
um, and their foundation to help fund the beginnings of our Food Rx program. So currently, um, we work with three clinics, um, the Logan Health Primary Care Clinic in Columbia Falls, um, the school-based clinics, and the Diabetes Pre and Prevention Center in Kalispell. These three clinics um, have a certain amount of prescriptions that they can give out each year. So the criteria that we start with is food insecurity. We prioritize families with children and then chronic illness. So we start with food insecurity. Um, and then the goals, we've tried to keep the goals actually very simple as we have been learning more about this program um, as we implement it. Um, and our goals are increased consumption of fruits and vegetables and increased comfort in using, preparing, and cooking fruits and vegetables daily. And with these simple goals, we really feel like we can um, expand our program and its reach. Um, to enroll in the program, um, patients go to regular doctor's appointments. Oftentimes, um, providers know who might have food insecurity, but they've implemented two food insecurity questions that we ask that they ask all patients. Once they have they answer those questions positively, they get offered um, the opportunity to enroll in the program. And so they fill out an enrollment form, they get actually a prescription. Um, we have a whole folder that we put together with um, kind of how the program works. We have initial recipes um, and some contact information in there. Um, and then once they're enrolled, we get um, an enrollment form that has de-identified information on it um, and patients contact us. And then we begin the process of creating a plan around um, food prescription. So we have two ways that we distribute food currently in our food prescription program. We have uh, the farmer's market option. So we are at the farmer's markets in Whitefish, Kalispell, and Columbia Falls each week. And if a uh, food RX patient chooses to, to come and have choice at the farmer's market, they come to our booth. We provide them with a food RX coin um, and they can buy directly from farmers. Um, and the way that we work that program, when we think about what we're doing with the prescription, it's for the entire family. So when it's a choice model, they get $7 per family member per week to come to the market and buy fresh fruits and vegetables. We just added an option of um, picking up a prepared food box. So this new option allows patients to have a little more flexibility um, in coming to grab food. Um, we have three different locations throughout the Valley um, and they can come and pick up food um, prepared for them each week. And then with those foods, we provide storage chips and recipes and other um, components to um, help that patient have success with um, the veggie prescription. So what we know um, from our patients is that they really do struggle with purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables. So when you are food insecure, it's really the priority is caloric intake. So you are buying prepackaged food um, and, you know, especially for your family, trying to purchase enough food so that um, nobody is hungry. And fruits and vegetables are expensive. So this program really alleviates some of that burden that comes with buying more expensive food. And we're working really hard to keep that those funds in the local economy um, by spending it with local farmers. You know, you'll look at this slide and this is about our diabetes cohort, but when we look at food insecurity as a whole, what we know is that our patients that start with us, we survey them all. They usually eat between one to two servings a week of fruits and vegetables. And we know that increases to, from, to, from one to two servings a week from two, five to seven in all of our patients that we're working with and sometimes four. Um, so when we look at this diabetes cohort that we had, from May to February of last year, you can see clearly that most of our patients dropped in their A1C and they dropped weight. The great thing about this partnership with Logan Health is that we have a lot of touchstone with these patients. So Tony, for example, is 
a patient that we have that is very invested in our organization. She loves the folks that she comes to see at the farmer's market every week. She's talking about how much she's eating um, in fruits and vegetables. She had, she drank a lot of sugary beverages and she told our staff, I'm going to quit sugary beverages. And so we just checked in with her each week. How's that going? How are you doing? She doesn't drink soda anymore. She also quit smoking, which was a huge piece. And we were able to provide some just peripheral support. And it's been a really, that piece of the program has been really special because I think when we think about patients that are struggling, you know, especially if they're struggling with chronic disease, you know, in a clinic setting, they're seeing, you know, every couple of weeks or every couple of months. Um, and with the prescription program, we're seeing them every week. We are not providers in any way, and we don't claim to be, we don't give health advice um, to clients, but we just offer support. So we say, that would be really great if you quit smoking, Tony, and, you know, keep us posted on how you're doing. Um, and we're invested in her as a person. And so I think that that really helps when we think about the work that we're doing. That touchstone is just as important as all the other pieces that we're doing. We just received a grant from No Kid Hungry, Share a Strength. The purpose of this grant is to increase um, our rural produce prescription program. We've had wonderful support from Logan, the Logan Health Foundation, both in Kalispell and Whitefish, and we have had help from private donors, but that's really just covered food. Um, and so this grant brings us an opportunity to actually have some support for staff time and for patient navigators and for marketing materials and driving food around. So having a little extra funding for those pieces has been really exciting with this grant. But most of the funds are going to go towards food. Over $30,000 of that $50,000 will go directly towards food for clients. So our goals with the, this increased funding for the next year and a half will be to, to add 30 families to our rural program. So um, rural clinics, the, we work with two rural clinics, one's in Columbia Falls and one's um, a part of the school-based program. We're also going to provide more educational opportunities. Um, and we're going to have more concerted effort to help folks apply for SNAP and WIC that are part of the program who may not be on those programs. Almost all the clients that we have are eligible for that. Um, we're working on finishing our cookbook and we're going to publish it, which we're very excited about. And we're really excited to glean new knowledge from the learning cohort with No Kid Hungry um, and their rural produce prescription toolkit. What we know is that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So if anybody's interested in starting a program, um, we would love to sit down and talk with you and, and help out in any way we can. Um, our contact info is at the bottom of the slide. Um, and we look forward to uh, hearing about other programs all over the state. Hi, my name is Amber Barone. I'm a registered nurse and functional medicine practitioner here in Belgrade, Montana. And I'm going to share a little bit about the Food RX project that I've started. It actually started back in November 2021 and will be wrapping up 10 months later in September. Today's discussion will focus on my motivation for starting the Food RX project. We'll explore some of the evidence backing the diet and lifestyle modifications for chronic disease management and kind of tiptoe into organic versus conventionally grown crops, why I chose organic for this cohort. And finally, we'll dive into how I structured the project, including the design, the community partners, funding, and before wrapping everything up, we'll talk about what the patients are saying. So I started my nursing career in the clinic where I gained some really valuable baseline experience before I branched out to travel nursing. I worked in various environments, including ERs, wound care, psych, long-term care, and critical access hospitals. One common denominator in all of these settings was the high prevalence of chronic disease. And this was my motivation for starting a FoodRx project. I wanted to get out ahead of these trends and really help people, especially low-income patients, prevent and reverse chronic disease. This graphic from the CDC is current. It shows chronic disease, chronic diseases, plural, are the leading cause of death and disability, with six in 10 adults having at least one, 
and four and 10 having two or more. This also leads to misappropriation of ER visits. Instead of treating the intended acute crisis, they are now being flooded with cases that revolve around chronic disease management and the costs associated are over four capital T trillion dollars annually. The American Journal of Medicine completed a systematic review back in 2004, which I realize is a little bit older study to be referencing here, but I'm referencing it because of the magnitude. It had so many studies involved. It was three meta-analysis studies, 10 randomized controlled trials, and nine cohort studies. And altogether, they found that structured aerobic exercise and increased physical activity benefits included an overall 25% reduction in mortality risk for cardiovascular disease, as well as decreased platelet aggregation, i.e. stroke risk, decreased systolic and diastolic blood pressure, decreased intra-abdominal and total body fat, improved insulin sensitivity and lipid profiles, and enhanced cardiorespiratory fitness. And benefits lasted over a year when they did a follow-up. So with the addition of diet and lifestyle interventions, we are seeing improved overall health and lasting transformation. Pharmacological interventions are just not enough. We can see this from the chart from Brinks and colleagues in 2016 on how statins fall short in moderating overall morbidity. So let's just take a look at this diagram. We have the variables on top, exercise versus statins, and then the columns corresponding. So cardiorespiratory fitness was increased with exercise, no change or decrease with statins. Cardiovascular mortality was decreased with both exercise and statins. Diabetes mellitus was decreased with exercise, but increased with statin consumption. Cognition function was increased again with exercise, no change or a decrease with statins. Fall risk again was increased with ex or decreased, excuse me, with exercise and no change or increase actually with statin consumption. Obesity decreased of course with exercise and no change with statins. So chronic disease numbers continue to rise in the US and despite our medical advances, cardiovascular disease remains the leading cause of death in the US. And as we just saw in the last slide is a major contributor to healthcare expenses as well. A well-cited study from the American Journal of Medicine was based on the gold standard randomized controlled trials that included 8,940 patients and they reported that exercise alone reduced cardiovascular mortality by 20% and all cause mortality by 26%. So we can see here how depression with cardiovascular diseased patients can lead to risky behaviors such as smoking, drinking, drugs, and how that in turn leads to non-compliance with medications, less energy, more inflammation, an increased recurrent of a cardiovascular event. More and more studies are associating the health of the gut, i.e. the buzzword microbiome, with mental health. And it's safe to say that there is a correlation to pesticide, herbicide exposure, and endocrine disrupting effects, along with neurotoxicity, which has been linked to overall mental health. While studies addressing the association between consumption of organic foods and improved health are admittedly small, one study in Sweden found that adults consuming just 500 grams of fruits and vegetables a day on average had 70 times lower toxicity exposure by eating organic. As for nutrient density, there is some debate, but one notable difference brought to light in this review comes from organic dairy, believe it or not, having 50% higher content of omega-3 fatty acids compared to conventional. And we know how vital omega-3s are to overall brain health. The reason I decided to make this pilot project organic was to minimize the exposure to pesticides, herbicides, and antibiotics which based on the evidence can be inflammatory and for patients struggling with chronic disease, 
their system may not have the extra resources to rid these toxins. So trying to make light of this a little bit with this comic here, it's not a funny matter though. In the grand scheme, childhood obesity rates vary per study, but clearly they're on the rise in the US. This is concerning for so many reasons, but especially because obesity promotes inflammation and increases the risk of chronic disease development throughout adulthood. Data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey 2020 revealed that rates of childhood and adolescent obesity have more than tripled since the 1970s. And youth from different ethnic backgrounds are disproportionately obese. Mexican-American, Hispanic, and non-Hispanic Black youth having above average prevalence of obesity. They narrowed it down to contributing factors, including diet quality, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, and stress. A systematic review from Nutrients in 2020 quoted, without intervention, it is projected that most youth will be overweight or obese and likely suffering from chronic disease in adulthood given current expected trajectories. Diet and lifestyle modification in adolescents or earlier is essential in the prevention of the development of chronic diseases in adulthood. The Belgrade Food Rx cohort was based on a family of four and kids are welcome and encouraged to partake in the nurse health coaching sessions, as well as all the community integrated options that we have, such as yoga, nutrition, gardening, and cooking classes. So this project started with 10 food insecure patients from Community Health Partners Belgrade. Food insecurity was established by being Medicaid slide B or slide C, and usually based on an average of a family of four. There's 30% that are Hispanic, 70% Caucasian. High cholesterol or dyslipidemia was determined by LDL levels being greater than 100. Hypertension was determined by blood pressure being greater than 140 over 90. Patients all came from Community Health Partners Belgrade, like I mentioned. And just to give you an idea of how many patients we had to choose from, i.e. there's no shortage of patients to be enrolled in projects like this, there's a total number of adult patients greater than 18 with hypertension diagnosis, there were 429. And for dyslipidemia, there was a total of 320 at the time of this study. So clearly there are several potential patients to work with, but I wanted to keep it fairly small and manageable since I was kind of a one woman show getting this off the ground. Patients come weekly for nurse health coaching and to receive their food boxes. The metrics I track include subjective data in the form of patient reported surveys that are offered quarterly, as well as the objective data where I'm gathering blood pressures and weights noting any medication changes, as well as labs. We started with some labs and then we will finish with labs comparing those lipid values. We have had some attrition. So we started with 10 patients and now we are down to eight, but I still think that's pretty good considering that's a big commitment on these patients to commit to coming in every week for 10 months. The grants I've received to date, they started with Department of Health and Human Service. It was called Food Pharmacy and it really got the ball rolling and also helped to set the parameters for the patient population. No Kid Hungry, Share Our Strength, continues to support the food and community integration costs of the project. And then I started a GoFundMe page as well to help cover the additional food costs. This FoodRx project starts with improving access to whole food by providing one food bag per week, roughly 10 pounds of organic fruits and veggies, along with heart healthy fats and proteins like canned fish and nuts, along with a few staples such as eggs, whole grains, legumes, oats, and occasional meat and dairy options as well. Emphasis across the board is on high fiber and low sodium. For this project, I pack the food bags weekly, varying the ingredients and trying to incorporate seasonally appropriate items, along with three recipes for inspiration. 
Local farms sell wholesale to FoodRx, which helps to keep the cost down and also creates a low carbon footprint and ultimately fresher, more nutrient dense produce. Grocers to date include Town and Country and Costco, who have either agreed to a percent discount and or provided gift certificates throughout the winter months to help keep us going. Reducing barriers to whole food is first, and then the project expands to covering the gamut of holistic healing options, such as having access to a gym, yoga, meditation classes, massage, sound healing, as well as gardening, cooking, and nutrition classes. The community integration piece is where we really can have profound effects on bridging the gaps in healthcare by leveraging community strengths and expertise, working collaboratively towards supporting patients and providing new understanding and tools so they feel more knowledgeable and empowered with all matters of health. Belgrade High School students and faculty contributed in a very impactful way for this and future FoodRx cohorts by building us two raised beds. The woodworking department built the beds. They're two by 10. The art department decorated those and the egg department designed and planted the crops for this season. Plans are in place to continue working together for future cohorts by having gardening classes on site. Here we have our partner Four Corners Yoga Studio offering yoga and meditation classes for FoodRx patients and their families. And patients have been returning week after week. They've been reporting feeling more flexible with increased strength, greater ability to tap into their bodies via breathing techniques to calm themselves down in situations that are stressful. Many studies back up the efficacy of using breath to tap into the parasympathetic side of the nervous system so the body can rest, reset, and restore. Mac Burgess from Towns Harvest and I just recently touring the garden, getting a feel for how the CSA share for FoodRx will be stocked for this growing season. Towns Harvest will supply two to three items per patient per week. The remainder of the food bag items will be filled from the food bank donations as well as other local farms that we've partnered with. Mac and his team will also offer fermenting and preserving classes open to food RX patients and families to attend at no charge and the growing season goes from July through September. Here's a complete list of our partners to date that have contributed in a very meaningful way. Without these partners, we wouldn't have near the impact potential on these patients' lives. And it's really been a fun process for me to go out, kind of introduce the movement that I'm trying to create here, and just how many of these community partners are excited about joining forces and truly making a difference in these patients' lives. Although there has been some ebb and flow with weight fluctuations and BP readings over the eight months to date, Patients overall report loving the support they are receiving. And even coming off their metformin, I had two patients that came off metformin, which is a really good sign that the whole food is starting to make a difference on their overall health. And we look forward to seeing how the labs compare from the start to the finish of this project. In summary, I just wanna finish up by saying, Despite the medical advances, chronic disease rates are astronomically high and pharmacotherapy alone is just not cutting the mustard for chronic disease management. It also leads to the misappro misappropriation of ER visits and the high costs associated with that care. Sadly, kids are no longer the exception. Obesity is leading to the inflammation and then that precipitates the chronic disease forming. Evidence does back the efficacy of lifestyle interventions and diet included in that. And we can do more as a community. Each of us can work together collaboratively to kind of bridge these gaps that are, that are glaring in our current conventional medicine. And here we have my references for today's topic. Food RX projects that reduce barriers to whole food and connect patients with additional community resources are a promising platform for bridging some of the gaps in our current healthcare. Patients can learn and grow and become empowered to make better health choices 
which leads to improved health outcomes. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Bridget McDonald, and I am um, on Maricor Vista at CFAC on the Food Access Team. This group um, initially started when CFAC started to come into contact with uh, multiple grassroots produce prescription programs that were operating around the state. Though they looked quite different, they all shared the common goal of increasing um, food access and security to low-income and food insecure Montanans around the state. And then so we um, ended up reaching out to each of these programs to learn more about them. We started to get to know the programs and then also um, we really thought it was important to bring everybody into the same room. So we started a working group and the goal of this working group is to establish connections and partnerships and then identify um, program efficiencies and challenges across programs and then also identify collaborative funding opportunities. Currently there are six existing produce prescription programs and then five additional partners um, who we are working with within our produce prescription collaborative and the existing programs include Bar One Wellness, which is located in Belgrade, Montana, the Livingston Food Resource Center Food Pharmacy Program, Fast Back Feet and Food Browning, and then the Missoula Fruit and Vegetable Prescription Produce Program run out of Providence St. Patrick's in Missoula, North Valley Food Rx up in the Flathead Valley, One Health, which actually has 12 locations across Montana, and then St. Peter's Food Pharmacy Program in Helena. And currently all of these um, seven existing programs are serve over, over 200 clients and then they're located in 14 counties across Montana, which you can see on this map. Um, and then some other additional partners that have been a part of our working group meetings are CSKT Health, Fort Peck Community College Wellness Center, Montana No Kid Hungry, and then the Montana State University Extension Nutrition Education Program. So one of the biggest needs identified across all the programs was the need to help fund for incentives. And so um, because of CFAC's experience operating the GusNet funded double SNAP dollars nutrition incentive program in Montana, um, which is a federal USDA operated program, um, we brought the idea of applying to the GusNet produce prescription program to all of our partners. And what this grant would do is it would um, cover up to three years and um, $500,000 for to be distributed across all the programs and it could help cover funding for fruits and vegetables, staffing and materials for all the programs. And it does not require a match at all. In collaboration with our partners, we decided to submit an application for this grant. And because it is a research focused grant, we did center around a research question. And so we decided to look at how all the different program models that we're working with in our collaborative affected their food security and then um, health outcomes. And then the two biomarkers that we decided to look at within each program would be A1C and cholesterol biomarkers among each participant. So because each of our partners works um, within a different community or um, at a different healthcare setting, and then also working with different local food outlets within their community, they all um, kind of have their own way of targeting participants. And really our role at CFAC is to support them and whatever method they want to do to identify and like serve their participants while also creating this collaborative approach to produce prescription programming. So we're just definitely still in the process of working with our partners to determine next steps and then also priority areas for this program. And then as we wait to hear back from GusNIP and under other funding sources, we are continuing to target um, other funding opportunities with all of our partners and then also working to develop resources to be shared across the collaborative, such as a Montana Produce Prescription Toolkit, which will kind of help lay a foundation um, for the emergence of new programs within the state. And then also working really closely with nutrition educators and the MSU um, extension program, as well as dietitians to create a broader nutrition education resource to then also be shared among the collaborative. Um, and then at CFRAC, we're also planning to um, host and operate a Montana-based produce prescription summit, which will elevate the voices then of a lot of our partnering organizations that we're working with, and then um, kind of the efficiencies and community best practices that we've been discussing as a collaborative. And um, we will also continue to further build our partnerships across Montana to support this collaborative and the individual, individual projects within it.